And today, as I said, we're finishing up a series, a very short series, on a very important topic. And the main point of each week is very easy to remember because it's two words. And what are they? Be ready. Be ready. So week one, just to give you a, a short review, week one we said, hey, be ready and make sure that you are, you know, serving. That's really important. Week two, we talked about this idea of be ready and watch. And today we're going to talk about this simple idea of be ready and work. So serve, watch, and work are kind of the big pictures for each of those three. And as we do that, what I would like to do is just start with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our topic, be ready, week number three. Father, thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you, Lord, for this time that we can come and sing and lift up our voice and lift up our heart and remind ourselves and declare to you that you are the one true God. Lord, there is no other God besides you. And today, Lord, we, we lift up our hearts in gratitude for all that you've done. We lift up our hearts in praise for the things that you're doing even right now. And Lord, we thank you for your glory. We thank you for your kindness. And we thank you for your great mercy and your patience in our lives. And Father, I pray today as we look at Matthew 25, I pray that we would really understand this parable in the context of what we need to do today. We need to be ready. We need to, as we've said, watch and serve but we also need to work. There's something that you're expecting from us to do. And Lord, I pray that you would help me to make that clear today. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. You can turn to your Bible to Matthew 25. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 30. And as we begin today, I want to ask you a very, very simple question. How many of you have money deposited in a bank today? Most of us do. But then the question becomes, well, why do we take our money and why do we place our money in a bank? I would like to suggest to you four different reasons. And there may be more, or you may summarize this differently. But I'd like to suggest to you four reasons why we take money and we place it in the care of a bank. Number one is the idea of, of watching. We want the bank to watch our money. We want to put it in a place where we can go online and look at our statement and look at how much money we have. The other thing is we want the bank to track our money. As money moves, as money comes in, as money goes out, as we transfer it, we want the bank to really know where did it go, when did it go there, and how did it get there. And then thirdly, I think we want the bank to protect what we have. Protect the money that we have, whether it's a little bit, whether it's a weekly deposit, a monthly deposit, we want to make sure that no one steals it. So you may have noticed as you go to a bank, they have a little in small print. They said your money is insured up to $100,000, FDIC, I believe it is. And then fourthly, we want the bank to grow our money. We expect to earn at least a little bit of interest. We want them to grow. We want them to expand the things that we have. In other words, you and I want banks to be good stewards, good administrators of the things, of the money that we put into their care. It's their responsibility. If somebody from the bank comes knocking on your door tomorrow and they say, I'm sorry, Mr. Sanchez, or I'm sorry, we've lost your money. None of us is going to be happy about that. But we will probably say to them, well, thank you for letting me know, but you are responsible to watch my money. You are responsible to take care of my money and make sure wherever it goes, you know exactly where it is at all times. Now, as we think about the Christian life, I want you to understand something. We are not owners of the things that we have. We are not. We are administrators, stewards of the things that God gives us to take care of these things, but also... God wants us to take care and watch and track and expand and protect and use what he's given us because he's waiting for a return. 
He's waiting for a return from your life and also from my life. So let's start with a few basic principles from Scripture to really help us this morning. Here it is. God owns everything. We own nothing. I know that's a very encouraging way to start, right? But that is what it is. God owns everything. We own nothing. Now, that should give you and it should give me a sense of relief. Okay, if God owns everything, then I'm simply a manager, an administrator of the resources he has entrusted to me. I'm a manager of God's resources. It doesn't belong to me. He lends it to me for me to manage. So what's the problem? I'm glad you asked. Here it is. When we decide to act like owners, we work against who? We work against God, miss opportunities to grow, and suffer loss. As long as you and I have a biblical understanding of money, resources, time, talents, all these things, we're going to be in a very good spot because we realize I have been entrusted. I have been given these things to borrow for a certain amount of time, a certain window of opportunity. And what God expects me to do is not to think and not to act like I own it all because I don't, but to think like a steward, a manager, an administrator who one day will give an account to the things that God has given. So we start there. We start with that large idea, that big thought. God is the owner of everything. But can I say something to you? The way you look at this statement drastically, I mean drastically, determines how you live. If you look at this as, no, I own some things. These things are mine. They're not God's. I've worked for them. I've owned them. I've inherited them. Your outlook on life, the decisions you make are going to be different than the person that says, I understand. Everything I have is a gift from God. And everything that God has given me, I am to manage to the best of my ability, to the best of my skill set, to really honor God with what I have. Now, we get to Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, what are we talking about? We are talking about the parable of the talents. We're talking about the parable, and some people say it's the parable of wasted opportunities. Now, all of us at one point or another in our lives, we have missed an opportunity. We missed it because we didn't schedule right. We missed it because we weren't prepared. But what I want to encourage you today is to not miss the opportunity that God gives us to be stewards of what he's entrusted to us. So let's start with this question. What will you do, what will I do with what you've been given? So we're going to start there. What are we going to do now that we understand God owns it all and we own how much? Nothing. Nothing. Matthew 25, 14. Jesus says, it's here in your bulletin. You can open up your Bible if you have your Bible with you. For it will be like a man going on a journey. Now, he's talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. He's saying, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servant, and notice the word, entrusted to him whose property? His property. If you want to underline that, his property. To one, he gave five talents. To another, two to another one and notice to each according to his ability then he went away so all of a sudden we're faced with this reality we have a person who has resources has employees has people working for him and he decides he's going to take a trip but before he takes a trip back in those days it was very common to leave in charge your employees and the people that work for you and to give them a, a measure of weight, to give them money, to give them resources so that they can manage things very, very well 
in your absence. So a talent, and when you look at this, you might think, well, what, is the, what exactly is meant by that word talent? A talent is not necessarily a coin. It's not necessarily a skill. It was a measure of weight. So he gave to each one of his servants a measure of weight. Now, obviously, if that's copper or silver or gold, that weight and the value, the value would change based upon the type of metal that it was. But the idea was very simple. In many terms, you would, you would come to this understanding, a talent was estimated to be a salary of a 20-year period. So if we say, okay, a person makes $50,000 a year, a talent would be the equivalent of how much? $1 million. And this is a lot of money. It's a lot of responsibility. But notice, there was a difference. The difference is some or one got how many talents? Five. He was given a lot. The other one was given two, kind of average. And the other one was only given one. But notice, each one of the servants was given something. And we're going to get to this point in a minute. But what I want you to understand is that the talents represent your abilities and my ability to take advantage of the opportunities that God gives us. It's a measure of weight. It was given to them, and they were responsible to take this talent and do something with it. God has given all of us a measure of weight, a talent, if you will, and he expects us all to use it. But God is also very aware that he gives us different gifts and skills and resources and abilities. I remember when I was playing baseball in high school, we had a guy that was playing shortstop, and I would play shortstop, pitcher, and catcher. But I really wanted to play shortstop because I loved that position. Most of the balls would be hit in that direction. There was just one small problem. The guy that was the starting shortstop for our team, he can hit left-handed, he can hit right-handed, Average probably 350 or 400 with either hand. He was an incredible fielder. So that meant when I went to the game and he showed up, I had to get real cozy on the bench because I was not going to play. God had given this guy a lot of talent. He gave me a little, but he gave him a lot. So as long as he was there, I was going to do my part and be ready in case he got injured or he could no longer play. But here's the reality. God distributes to us differently according to the capacity that he's given us. So what do we really have that God has given us that we all have in common? Here it is in your notes. He's given us time. He's given you and me time. And I define time this way. It's the limited window of opportunity to get things done. We all have 24 hours in a day. We're all given the same amount of time. It's a limited amount in every day. You can't buy time. You can't do things to purchase more time in a day. There's 24 hours. That's what you get. Like it or not, take it or leave it. That's the window of opportunity. But God gives you and I a window where we can get things done. And then that window closes. It's no longer available. It's like when you're applying to a school and they say the deadline is May 15th. If you want to start here in the fall, you have to submit your application by May 15th. We will not accept applications after May 15th. Now, you may get on a plane and go visit the campus and show up on May 16th, and they will kindly say, I'm sorry, the window of opportunity has closed. You're going to have to wait until the next semester. So time is that window. Now the other thing we have is we have talents, and I'm going to use this a little differently. Talents are the abilities and skills that God gives us to grow. He gives us different capabilities, different skills, and he wants us to leverage those things to grow. And number three, he gives us treasure, money and property to manage for God's resources. So he gives us time, talents, and treasures. We all have the same amount of time. 
We all have different amounts of abilities and skills and treasures. But what I want you to know is this. It doesn't matter how much you have. It doesn't matter how much you don't have. What matters is your responsibility to manage what God has given you. Notice verse 16. It says, He who had received the five talents when, went when? At once. Right away. He didn't wait. He didn't delay. As soon as he got it, he went to work. And it says, and traded with them, and he made five talents more. He doubled what was given to him. Verse 17. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. So three guys got three measures of talents and they each had an opportunity. They each had an opportunity to do something productive, to do something efficient, to do something that would give their master a return. Listen, you and I have a window of time to be productive for the things that matters to God and use our skills and use our abilities and use the property that we're managing and use our job and use our education and use all these things for God's eternal purposes. But notice what the third servant did. The first two went out and they doubled their money, but this guy decided to get a shovel. He said, you know, okay, those guys are going to invest and they're trading and they're doing their thing, but you know, I'm going to just take it easy. I'm going to dig a little hole. I'm going to take this talent and I'm going to just bury it in the ground. Now, this was actually common practice in those days. When there was a change of government, people would take their money, their possessions, and they would bury them because they didn't want in the change of government for the government to take what they owned. So they actually thought this was a secure way to put it away so that the government wouldn't touch it. But there's a principle that you and I have to understand. It's here in your notes. God gives you opportunities or talents to maximize your abilities as you manage, enjoy, and grow what belongs to him. This is what God does. He gives you and I the opportunities not to just bury what he's given us, but actually to use them and belong to them. Have you ever followed an artist? Regardless of what your genre may be, you know, you follow an artist and you remember when they first started and 10 years ago to today and how their voice has developed or their musical ability and they're just, they're on a different level. Why? Because they practice, they rehearse, they put in the hours, they put in the work, they have taken their skill set, taken their experience, and they've really maximized that gift. And yes, they were great when they started, but now it's like, whoa, they are fantastic. What God wants you and I to do is to consider all that he has given us and leverage that for his purposes. Why is that so important? Because one day, God will settle accounts with all of his servants. One day you and I will stand before the Lord. One day, for those of us who know Christ, we're not going to stand before God to determine whether we're going to heaven or hell. We've already took care of that as we've accepted Christ as our Savior here. We're going to stand before God to see if what we did stands the test of fire, if what we did really was for God's purposes and God's glory. Now, look at verse 19. Verse 19 says, Now after a long time, somebody say long time. Long time. So again, Jesus is talking to them in, in this idea of waiting. Time's going to go by because the disciples thought, no, Jesus is going to come back right away. He's going to set up his kingdom right away. We're going to be reigning with Christ. We're going to be in charge along with Jesus. He said, whoa, 
I want you to know I'm not coming back that quickly, but I am coming back soon. So he says, now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Notice, and he who had received the five talents came forward. So this guy, remember, this is a high capacity dude. He's excited. He's like, hey, master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. Now, he wasn't bragging. He was just saying, Lord, what you gave to me, I was able to double it. Notice. Notice what his master said. He said, well done, good. So he starts with his character. Good. Your character is good. That's what I was looking for. That's what I was expecting. I was expecting a return on the investment I made in you. I was expecting you to be responsible with what I gave you. You are good. You're doing what I'm saying. You're following my instructions, and now you are good. You are faithful. And he says, you have been faithful over a little bit. Now, he got more than all the others. But you've been faithful over a little. I will set you over what? Much. Enter into the joy of your master. So he's saying, bro, good job. Way to go. You did it. You are high capacity. I gave you what was fair, what was just to your capabilities, and you stepped up. You didn't make excuses. Right away, you went to work, and you got it done. Listen. It honors God when you and I work hard. I've run across people at times in previous jobs or in school where they say, well, I'm just going to go to school or I'm just going to go to work and I'm going to talk to people about Jesus all day. If my manager gets upset at me, I just need to let them know that I'm doing the Lord's work. I work for the Lord, not for them. And they may say, well, then go for the work for the Lord somewhere else, not here. That doesn't honor God. What honors God is that we're responsible with the things that God gives us, and we honor Him in our studies, we honor Him in our work, we honor Him in our projects for our clients. That's what honors God. So notice what it says in your bulletin. God's favor is given to faithful servants. Those who walk by, what's that word? Faith. Work hard to grow what God has given you. So he's given us different abilities, gifts, skill sets, so he wants us to use it to grow. Secondly, as we've already said, your character is going to determine your service to God. That's what we're going to do. It's going to be a reflection of our character. It's going to be a reflection of the real us. If we don't care, it's going to be revealed it's going to be made known in the lack of work that we're doing for God, the lack of effort, the lack of caring. That's going to be very clear by the lack of effort that we put into what God has asked us to do. And number three, faithful servants are focused on pleasing the Lord, but unfaithful servants only focus on pleasing themselves. So here's the question. If you could divide your life into two categories and ask this question, who do I wake up every day to please? Is it God? Is it Jesus Christ? Or is it me? Who, when I wake up every day, do I want to honor with my life? Do I want to make sure I'm, I'm serving? Is it God or is it me? So look at verse 22. It says, and he also, who had the two talents, came forward. So this is a guy that is of average capacity. Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, notice the similarity. Well done. Good. That's also he's speaking of his character. Good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter 
into the joy of your master. But wait a second. He didn't produce as much as a guy with five. That's fine. He was given two. He was given a different weight, a different measure of responsibility. But what he had, he multiplied for God. The problem sometimes that we have in our Christian life is that we compare ourselves to others who might have greater capacity, who might have incredible gifts just beyond our capacity. Listen, God's not asking you to be like them. He's not asking you to be like anyone else. He's asking you to be responsible with what he's given you because that is what you and I are going to be accountable for. The reward was the same for both servants. It's not about how much am I getting. It's not about how much do I have. It's about how much effort am I putting into what God has given me to do the things that he's called me to do. But notice, we all love to receive prizes. We all do. I mean, I remember when I was in elementary school and they would call the name Outstanding Students. I would sit down. That's not me. Come, somebody else clapping. I was happy for them. You know, another student, they would call the name Perfect Attendance. No, that's not me either. I was happy for the person with perfect attendance. And then another one, you know, Outstanding Scholar. That wasn't me either. And I was clapping for that person, the Outstanding Scholar. And my PE coach said, good sportsmanship. And he called my name and said, yeah, that's me. I don't care if I win or I lose. All right, coach, thank you. I got one award. But all of us love to get recognized, do we not? Good job, good, and faithful servant. But notice, this reward, this encouragement is not for the faithless. It's for the faithful. So look at verse 24. It says, he also who had received the one talent, came forward. Five, two, one. Saying, Master, L listen to what he says. I knew, I knew you to be a hard man. Now, is there any evidence so far that this owner was a cruel, tough, harsh? No. He says, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow. He's saying, I knew you were the kind of guy that you would find stuff produced in places that you didn't even plant. He says, I knew you to be a hard man where you scattered seed, you gathered where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours, obviously with a little bit of dirt. So what happens here? This guy had a responsibility. He was given one talent. He was given a measure of talent that was significant. Now, it wasn't two, it wasn't five, but it was according to his capacity. It was not beyond his capacity. It was perfect for what he was capable of doing. But what he did instead, he decided to flip the script. He said, you know, Lord, you're a hard man to please. You are rough, you're not fair, you are the kind of guy that you take what doesn't belong to you. He's questioning his integrity. It's almost like he's a prosecutor. I mean, he's the one that's being asked questions, and he's asking like he's a prosecutor and saying, you didn't do this, and, and you didn't do that, and you should have done this, and what else do you expect me to do but to bury the very talent that you gave me? Now, all that he said was not true at all, not in the least. And sometimes we do the very same thing. Sometimes we, we think that God is unjust. That cannot be further from the truth. God is perfectly just in all of his ways, in all of his motives, in all that he does. God is perfectly holy and majestic and glorious there is not any sin in the person of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. There is no sin. They have committed no 
sin. But sometimes we say, you know, Lord, it's your fault that things didn't turn out the way they should have. It's your fault I lost this job. It's your fault I didn't get into this school. It's your fault I turned out this way or I didn't have enough to do this. It's your fault. And you know what happens? We start judging God's character. Be very, very careful when you judge God's character. You are not the judge. I am not the judge. You and I are but dust. But God, looking at us in our dust, in our helpless situation, God left his throne. He came down in the person of Jesus Christ. He completely took care of things for us. He looked at our sin. He knew that we couldn't take care of our sin on our own. So he stepped in and lived a life without one single sin. Tempted like you, tempted like me, never sinned at all. And just to prove that he was just and pure and he had looked at our situation, he gave us the answer to the biggest problem that you and I have ever faced. It's the sin problem that separates us from a holy and perfect God. But he didn't just come and tell us that we were sinful. He went to the cross. He allowed others to spread his hands and and nail his hands, and he suffered, and he bled, and he died. And they put him in the grave. They rolled the stone. And for three days, everybody was without hope. Everyone thought, this guy, well, we thought he was, we thought he would, but maybe we were wrong. And after three days, the Bible says, through the power of the Holy Spirit, God raised him from the dead to prove that death has no power over God. So this God, who sometimes people accuse, sometimes people question, you can ask questions, but don't judge the character of God because he's not like you and he's not like me and he doesn't think the thoughts that we think he's way beyond that but notice about the unfaithful servant it says the unfaithful servant refuses to change he didn't repent he blamed the owner it's your fault that type of person makes no plans to change commits no time to change, and invests zero energy. He didn't even try to succeed. He just said, I'm going to bury it. I'm going to bury it in the ground. I'm not going to do anything with what he has given me. Maybe he thought the owner wasn't going to come back. Maybe he thought, well, if I, if I hide it here, then, you know, I know where it is. Many people today believe that they will not stand before God for their lives. Many people believe, I've heard that in church, I've seen that in the movies, but I really don't believe God is going to judge me like a perfect judge with just scales. And if I have rejected his son then when I get before God, it's going to be too late to accept his son. And, and I may be upset, and I may be saying something to God at that moment, but God in that moment is just as just then as he is right now. And we will be without excuse because we have missed the window of opportunity that God has given us to turn from our sins and turn to God. So notice what it says in your notes. God's judgment will be on the faithless. Those who buy unbelief. Would you circle that word, please? Unbelief. Become lazy, risk-free, fearful, or hide what God has given them. They're just lazy. It's not that they're terrible people. They're just lazy. I've got plenty of time. This life that I have, I'm young, I've got many years ahead, I've got good genes in my family, Marcel, you know, I've got some that have lived to 90. I'm okay, I've got plenty of time. When you know to do right, 
and you choose to do wrong, you choose to do nothing, that's when you sin. That's when we sin against God. So here's the question. Have you become spiritually lazy? As you look at your life, are you casual about the things that you know really matter to God? You have a friend, they're a great guy, they're a great gal. I mean, you guys are like peanut butter and jelly. You hang out, it's just great. You laugh a lot, but you know that if they were to die today, they would stand before God guilty and condemned and without hope. And you have the very words of eternal life. You know Jesus Christ is your Savior. You have that talent of responsibility, but you say, but I don't want to mess up this friendship. I don't want to get them upset. Do you think they're going to be more upset today than they will when they stand before God knowing that you have the truth and you chose to just hide it? What are you going to say to God? What am I going to say to God when he says, what about him? What about her? You're so busy. You missed this opportunity, and now it's too late. So what opportunities are you hiding from? What is it that you could start that could make a difference in your job? It might be getting together with people once a week over coffee and just reading a chapter from the Gospel of John. It might be praying with people on Zoom, talking with them over the phone, just making an effort. But Marcel, I'm just comfortable. I'm really comfortable. I don't want to just get into that, you know, because they might ask me a question that I don't know the answer to. I get plenty of those all the time. And I'll say, I'll, I'll get back with you. I'm not sure, but I'll get back. But listen, listen to what Jesus said to this servant that with a measure of talent decided, I'm going to hide it. He said, but his master, verse 26, answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. I never want to hear those words come out of the mouth of my God. You wicked and slothful servant. So what does he do? He begins to flip the script again. He says, all right, you judge me unjustly. You gave me a character that I did not have, but now I'm going to use your words against you. Notice what he says. You knew that I reaped where I have not sown and gathered where I had no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers at my coming. I should have received what was my own with what? With interest. In other words, he said, at the very least, you should have taken the money. You should have put it in the bank so that I would have gotten at least, you know, 0. .00 something. In that time, it was 6% interest. But some kind of interest, you should have done something with what I gave you. I didn't give you five, you couldn't handle it. I didn't give you two, you couldn't handle it. I gave you one. What did you do? with the one. And this is where we see in Scripture. Laziness is not okay. Laziness, when you're not doing what God wants you to do, God looks at that as wicked. That's sinful. And then we get to verse 28. So he says, Take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For everyone who has, notice, will, be more, will more be given. And he will have an abundance. Now, some people say, wait, 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 wait a minute. What do you mean he's going to take the talent from him? I mean, that was his. He, he gave it to him, and he did. But he missed the opportunity to use it. He wasted the opportunity. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast that worthless servant into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Now, you need to understand there are two views in this last part, just to be fair. There's one view that says this is talking about people who, who say they're believers and they are going to lose reward. They're going to have a lot of regret because they've wasted the opportunity. Another group will say, well, this is talking about people that are in church, but they're really not believers. So at the end, God is going to separate them and both have certain validity. The challenge is always you don't want to make a doctrine on a parable. So you have to step back and look at all of Scripture, not just one part of Scripture. But here's something we do know. What we don't use for the Lord, we're in danger of losing. That is clear. What you and I decide, I am not going to put the effort. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to serve. I'm not going to watch. I'm not going to work then we're in danger of losing the very gift, the very resource, the very talent that God has given us. That's the clear reality. Now, somebody who knows Christ and misses the windows of, of opportunity, will they have regret when they see their Lord? Yes, they will. They will regret the opportunity lost. But notice, the faithless will lose and the faithful will win that's what we see in the bible the faithless lose when you don't have faith you will lose when you are faithful when you do have faith you will win ultimately so it says the faithless will lose all that they have been given to manage he got the talent he had the opportunity the window closed. The opportunity was lost. What God gave him, he gave it to the other. Second point, it says you can lose what God's given you by taking no spiritual risks. What is it that God has been working in your heart to do for him? That you're just afraid. I mean, let's be honest. You're, you're afraid to do it. You don't think you can. You, you're just second-guessing yourself, but but God has put this burden in your heart. I remember, I think it was about 20 years ago, if I'm not mistaken, the first time Russell asked me to prepare a message in Spanish. I was terrified to the core of my soul. I said, do you really want me to do this? I mean, in my head, it's like, do you really want to put your people suffering through this, you know? But little by little, God would help me and he would bring tutors and, and at the end of the Spanish service and even today, people come up to me and say, Marcel, look, you said this word wrong and that word this. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm so sorry, Marcel, I got to tell you these things. I go, no, 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 please. Please tell me because I really want to get better. And if you just ignore or if you say, great job, oh, my, I can't believe you missed that. You know, that doesn't help me. What are you afraid of doing? That, yeah, I may feel a little embarrassing, maybe uncomfortable and maybe something you have to further develop and study but what are you afraid of doing that you know in your heart god is moving in your heart to start don't miss the window of opportunity and number three the faithful will be rewarded with more responsibility but i want you to notice that second word and circle it joy responsibility joy and resources to manage it's like that person who work at and they're working and they get a job done and they go back to their boss and say okay what's next what else can i do does everyone do that no most people say okay i'm done with this project i'm going to take now an additional break because i'm you know really tired and but the person who has character says what else can i do how else can i be of of service how else can I do something to make a difference? So here's the final point. Our readiness for Jesus' return is determined by our stewardship, very important, our stewardship of the resources that he has given us. If today you feel that you own all that you have, it's all yours, you're not ready. 
you're not ready to meet the one who will show you that it doesn't belong to you because he will take from what you think is yours and give it to another so to the believers today i say this are you a five talent believer are you that high capacity person god has given you incredible gifts maybe intellectual gifts maybe skills in different industries or are you a two you know he hasn't you know you're not a, a superstar you're not here but you're kind of like right in the middle of the road or, or maybe he's giving you a one it doesn't matter if you're a five a two or a one what matters that you're using to the best of your god-given abilities whatever god has given you to honor him in the window of opportunity that you have i like to close with this simple reminder in first corinthians 3 it says for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid which is jesus christ now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold silver precious stones wood hay straw each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives he will receive a reward if anyone's work is burned up he will suffer loss though he himself will be saved but only as through fire i really believe the person that says, I'm the owner, I'm in charge, this is all mine, I've got to manage this, I own this, that person's going to stand before God, tested by fire, all that stuff is going to go away. But the person who stands before God and has lived their life as somebody, not as an owner, but as a manager, that person will stand that test of fire their works, the things that they have done. And they might even hear these words, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in very little. I will give you responsibility over much. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Would you bow your heads this morning? If you're here today and you know Christ as your Savior, the one question I would ask you is, as you look back at just this week alone, just this week, have you been living your life as an owner or as an administrator? Have you lived your life as a good steward, somebody that is responsible, somebody that's trying to maximize somebody who's working and, and trying to do things that will honor God? Or are you looking at everything through the lens of self-satisfaction? If you identify more with the latter, why don't you just take a minute right there where you are and say, Lord, would you please forgive me for my sin and my lack of understanding that I am not an owner of anything that you've given me. Lord, I am simply your manager. Would you forgive me for my sin? And if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, and you say, Marcel, I am here in church today, or I'm watching online, and I've got to be honest, I'm still struggling with this. I didn't grow up very religious, but I'm still struggling accepting Christ and submitting to him by faith. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you. You say, this is hard for me. I'm not a very spiritual guy or girl. I just, I'm struggling with this, and I, I need prayer. If you would just raise your hand, I would definitely pray for you. And if you're here today and you're ready, to accept Christ I would say just ask the Lord right where you are 
Lord, I know that you died on the cross for my sins. I know that you came for me. I believe in Jesus Christ. He rose from the grave. And I'm so sorry for the sins that I've committed. Lord, would you change my heart? Lord, would you help me to live as your servant? Father, thank you for this day. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us. I know this could be a hard lesson, a hard message to listen to. But Lord, sometimes we just need to say things plainly and look inside and ask ourselves, are we acting like owners? Or are we acting like your steward, your manager? I pray that you would help us. In Jesus' name.